Welcome to APUSH Summarize, tackling everything you need to know for the AP test. Probably won't go over anything prior to this, maybe in the future early American settlements, because the odds of it mattering are surprisingly low. Plus it's super boring, so... 1700s marked the growing contradiction between the flourishing of both slavery and freedom in the United Kingdom, which by the way basically gets created in 1707 with the Union Act. Alright, so there's this big thing called the Atlantic Slave Trade, which basically summarized all the interactions between the Old World, Africa, and the New World. Europe sold to Africa modern technology like guns and clothes, Africa sold... Africans to Europeans headed to the New World, and then the African slaves harvested cash crops like tobacco and cotton to sell back to Europe. You may be chilling in the North and say, now nah, wait just a second, I know my innocent little state didn't have slaves because it's those southern bastards that committed those atrocities. And while you'd only be partially right, while Northern states did not rely on slavery to cultivate their yields of fish or lumber, they still regularly purchased slaves and participated in triangular trade because they could sell slaves to the South for hella bank. That middle part of the trade where Africa sells Africans is known as the Middle Passage, which is by far one of the worst places you could be in the 1700s. Hundreds of slaves would be packed into these ships where disease ran rampant. Dead slaves were often found way after they died and simply thrown off the boat. African kings subjected their people to such injustices for pure power, as West Africa at this point was filled with tiny, decentralized tribes that could be easily taken over with European guns. Tribes like the Ashanti and the Dahomey quickly rose to power by exploiting their own people, but at the future cost of the hindered development of West Africa compared to the rest of the world. There were two main types of slavery in the South, Chesapeake slavery and Carolina slavery, both byproducts of the crops cultivated. And while there were a few free blacks in Virginia, laws created by the Virginian government reduced the rights of blacks so significantly that by 1750 the only feasible way to be a Virginian black was to be a slave. The reason for these rights reduction laws was just racism, citing that because blacks were an inferior species they had no rights. Since tobacco farms tended to be pretty small, slaves were under constant supervision, preventing the emergence of black culture seen in the Carolinas. Over in the Carolinas, life was a literal hellhole, as the main product of cultivation was rice, which was ironically taught by the Africans to the Europeans. If you've ever been to the rice fields, you know that rice has to be inundated with water, which in these colonial times was infested with malaria. It was not as bad as it was in the West Indies though, which was the same as Carolina but 10 times hotter and more diseased. One of the benefits of rice farming was that the plantations were so massive that blacks were left to their own devices, which led to the development of a pan-African culture. You see, even though whites considered all Africans the same, the reality was that many of the tribes didn't vibe well with each other. However, when you and a bunch of other dudes get abused 24-7 together, you tend to get closer to them. The result was a blend of cultures and languages between the Africans, symbolized by the shared language Gullah. The slave trade saw patterns of decline parallel to how far north you were. In New England and the mid-Atlantic colonies, most families owned one slave, if any at all, and most businesses tended to prefer wage workers over slaves since slaves were a long-term investment that couldn't be quickly sold the same way a wage worker could be easily fired. Since blacks were such a minority in the north, northerners were way less afraid of blacks and so laws were much more lenient than in the south. Northern blacks had the unique right to trial by jury, file a lawsuit, testify against whites, and more. Further down in the Chesapeake region, slaves were much more important to the economy so they lacked the rights northerners had. Still, blacks made up a minority of the population. Even further south in the Carolina region is where things started to get wild. Rampant malaria killed off many slaves while they were young, so unlike in the Chesapeake region where slaves could repopulate naturally, population in the Carolinas had to be artificially boosted by the slave trade. As for the West Indies, words can't describe how bad the conditions were. Plus, this video is about American history, not English or Spanish history. Anyways, the result of these differences in geography led to the formation of three distinct African cultures, the whitewashed northerner, the half and half Virginian, and the strong cultured Carolinan. I don't know where to fit this, but Georgia was also created in the 1730s as a buffer between Florida and South Carolina, chartered to James Oglethorpe in 1733. Intending it to be a moral safe haven for the poor, James abolished alcohol and slavery, which colonists weren't pleased about. In 1751, James gave up on humanity and sold Georgia back to the crown, where slavery and alcoholism were quickly returned and Georgia basically became South Carolina Jr. Of course slaves tried to resist and escape. It seems like a no-brainer to us, but for the arrogant British, apparently that was a real shocker. They revolted everywhere from the Virgin Islands to Jamaica, with the first being in New York City in 1712 where slaves burnt down buildings and killed nine whites. It ended with the eight leaders of the rebellion being tortured and executed to be made an example of. Meanwhile in Jamaica, the Maroons were wild and decided to wage a war on the British and actually won, but only because the British settled on the compromise that any fugitives that came to Jamaica would have to be returned back. Things got really heated up in 1739 when to spice things up for the War of Jenkins' ear, the Spaniards said any slave who came to their colonies, like Florida, would be declared free. Hundreds of slaves from South Carolina and Georgia tried to escape to Florida, only to be caught again by the state militia. The biggest of these uprisings, the Stono Rebellion, led to the deaths of 200 blacks and 24 whites as a bunch of blacks decided to rise up and kill any white person spotted, ultimately exterminated by the South Carolina militia. Those who actually made it to Florida would be spun around and enlist in the Spanish army to fight battles like in St. Augustine, basically a massive debate. Now on Britain. The biggest irony of them all is that Britain prided itself on the being the best, 
coolest, freest nation on the planet, and that any non-Britons were slaves. The British constitution focused heavily on balancing liberty and power, the former being the biggest buzzword ever buzzed in American history. Liberty in these days was more associated with rebelling from the government authority and freedom from various injustices, like being ripped off at the local bakery. The two branches of liberty-based philosophy were republicanism, or the idea that virtue and therefore liberty was derived from owning land, and liberalism, or the Lockean idea that all are born with a natural right to life, liberty, and property. These Republicans would form the country party and believe that if you own land, you could resist being swayed by temptations of your creditors. By the mid-18th century, political parties were more or less stable entities. Your classic Federalists and Democratic Republicans will come soon, but not yet. Let's look at some civics. Only propertied white men could vote, which basically limited politics to them, the justification being that other people lacked free will, aka classist, racist, sexist BS. But more men could vote in America than in England because the larger landmass meant more could afford land. This is also the origin of the owning land equals freedom idea that pervades American history. Because sports and hentai haven't been invented yet, a large majority of Americans now begin to entertain themselves with politics, forming local groups like Benny Frank's Juntos Club to discuss local happenings. As a result, the literacy rate was remarkably high in the colonies and newspapers heavily proliferated. But what about civic freedom? Freedom of speech basically did not exist, as in fact only recently did Parliament even get the right to take any stands with legal immunity. So yeah, if you're gonna pull a James Frank and criticize the government, you're going to jail for seditious libel. Freedom of press was supposed to be assured in 1640 with the agreement of the people, but it wasn't enforced until 1695. Even then, the government hushed up opposition since you needed a government license to publish a successful newspaper. In 1735, newspaper writer Peter Zanger famously went to court for criticizing the governor of New York. Fortunately, no one liked that governor, so he actually won the case and was acquitted, an important legal precedent for the freedom of press. The European Enlightenment had just happened and colonials were like, yeah. What if we just had that too? Religion was attacked with reason, and many of your favorite revolutionaries like Franklin and Jefferson subscribed to two rapidly growing religions, Deism and Arminianism, both of which prioritized studying natural laws rather than religious scripture. And atheistic America? How can we force a sense of community and uniformity among our people? Fortunately, the First Great Awakening has the answer. The United States follows a cyclical acceptance and rejection of religion that waxes when people are fearful of unknown things like disease or mortality, and wanes when people get sick of religious opinions being shoved down their throats. Economic growth was making making people give less thought about attending mass, which obviously pissed off preachers. The 1730s saw a sweeping galvanization to get people back in pews, preachers like George Whitefield traveling up and down the colonies to fear monger people into going back to church by claiming that everyone's going to hell and the only way to repent is to go to church. These revivalist churches had that focused on fiery passions appeal to the plight of the middle class, calling out the rich for spending lavishly and disgracing God, which is why they, the new light, quickly overtook the traditionalist old light in popularity. Widespread literacy and newspaper circulation also facilitated the influence of the Great Awakening. As for politics, each colony had its own rules and policies because the British were engaging in a policy of salutary neglect, where they basically dipped for a couple of years and then told the colonists to do whatever they want, as long as they paid their taxes. Each colonial government generally had an assembly and a governor. The governor was usually just a puppet of the assembly, as since the assembly controlled his wages, they had him sign whatever they want to become law. The assembly the assembly was basically a mini parliament and was largely out of touch with the community since the eligibility restrictions for becoming a part of the assembly included a large land requirement, confining the assembly to the minorial elite. Rampant corruption meant that only in the middle colonies were elections even contested and even then in the north, rampant nepotism occurred. The two big guys besides Britain in North America were Spain and France. Spain's colonies in North America were sparsely populated and hella weak, so they spent most of the 1700s beefing their colonies up north, establishing friendly relations with the Pueblo Indians and expanding with missionaries north into Texas, east into Florida, and west into the California region. This was especially important because now the Russians, who were in Alaska, couldn't cop California for themselves. The Spanish horribly abused the indigenous Indians, organizing presidios where the Indians worked basically as slaves. The native population shrunk by two-thirds by the time Mexico gained independence. The important thing years that the Spanish had no qualms about their northern possessions, as they were heavily focused on abusing South America. The French, on the other hand, were almost as bawling as the English. They had settled up in Canada and along the St. Lawrence River. Unlike the British, the French were nice to the Native Americans, and so the Indians were cool with them, and together they created a lucrative fur trading industry. Between French and English possessions was the extremely fertile Ohio River Valley, where three very important American rivers all intersected. The French wanted it for its trading opportunities, the British for cropland, and the Cherokee and the Chickasaw from the south for hunting and the Delawares and the Shawnees wanted it because they got evicted out of Pennsylvania by the British. Even worse, the British, the greedy people that they were, chartered the Royal Ohio Company, oh I don't know, an entire strip of land half a million acres wide that stretched from Virginia to the Pacific Ocean. So naturally, they all went to war for it, known as the French and Indian War in America or the Seven Years' War in Europe. Prior to 1688, Britain was what they in Britain would empathetically call a shithole country. They weren't number one in anything at all, but this would change after a series of wars like Queen Anne's War and the War of Jenkins' Ears plagued Europe. 
The high taxation rates to fund these wars will eventually be the same that sparked the American Revolution. Basically, G dubs the map scouter that was sent to scout west of Virginia. When he scouting, he came across French Fort Duquesne and was like, huh, I thought there was not supposed to be anything here. Let me go investigate this. Whereupon he learned this land supposedly belonged to the French. GW reported this to his company and the Virginia government and they were like, no, if you read this document that we wrote here, it clearly says this belongs to the English, and sent Washington with an army to go settle things. The French figured this would happen and brought their own army, and the diplomats began to settle things out. Oh, you thought we were chillin'? Nah, some English Indian dude decided to bury a hatch into the French diplomat and war breaks out. French supporting Indians, which were the majority of Indians, quickly joined in attacking the British, hoping that they could get their land back. Out of necessity, Washington hastily built Fort Necessity and they began to duke it out. For the first two years, England was getting destroyed, but then they decided to use all those taxes they had been building up to beef up their military and pay Prussia and Austria to fight France, who had now formed a coalition with Spain and Russia. Ugh, European politics. But fortunately, we don't have to care too much about them. Having to fight a war in two places, France decided to give up fighting the British over the stupid Ohio land and let them win the French and Indian War. They decided to basically spin a wheel and RNG France's American possessions, with France giving Canada and everything east of the Mississippi to the British and Louisiana to the Spanish. In exchange for Canada, France received the meager Guadalupe and Martinique Islands, which seemed like a good idea at the time since they were more lucrative with their sugar plantations, but we can see how that turned out now. Spain gave Florida to the British in exchange for Havana, and you can see why no one likes reading about the Treaties of Paris. Apparently, no one invited any Indians to the negotiation table, a running theme for France and Britain, which led to the Indians revolting under Chief Pontiac. Pontiac's rebellion could just as easily be called Neolin's rebellion because he was the one that had a vision from basically God that said that Indians need to cast themselves away from British culture and materialism, such as alcohol, which basically was used by the British the same way opium was in China. Now, I'm not saying anything, but Neolin did some wild stuff, like predicting an eclipse clips from a vision when math and physics are basically non-existent for Indians, so... Anyways, he told his brother Pontiac to wait for him to get back to from business before he goes all willy-nilly with fighting, but Pontiac of course saw the British and impulsively attacked. Neelan formed the concept of pan-Indianism, or that Indians must unite together and disregard their tribal disputes and rid themselves of the British. All the Indians laid siege on British ports like Detroit, for example, and actually ended up winning. The British, more concerned with preventing future conflict and less with the welfare of Indians, established the Proclamation Line of 1763, which prevented English expansion west of the Appalachians. The entitled colonists were naturally infuriated with this and violated it regularly, even so-called moral exemplars like Washington did it. The British did nothing because, again, solitary neglect. The war's permanent impact was that it forever ruined Native American relations with the colonists, even in places like Pennsylvania, which used to be the most accepting towards the Indians. During the French and Indian War, most of the Quakers resigned from office since they did not improve of war, effectively ending William Penn's holy experiment. Now, all Indians were forcibly removed from Pennsylvania, with groups like the Paxton Boys actively massacring peaceful Indian tribes and calling for the government to basically engage in genocide. At the very least, it is said that Americans were no more British than they were in 1763, as a strong sense of national unity and belonging to Britain emerged among them. Despite this, the colonies struggled to work together to achieve anything, as seen when Governor Clinton of New York tried to organize an all-colony meeting for an assessment of Indian relations. Only three colonies bothered to send delegates, and when Ben Franklin created the Albany Plan of 1754, which would set up a federal council and a president general, it was shut down by smaller colonies like New Jersey who felt like their voices would be drowned out by their overbearing, overpopulated neighbors. With India and French territories added to the British bank account, it would become harder and harder to enforce Anglo-Saxonic superiority and British liberty, paving the way for our next video on the American Revolution.